Seth Andrews is my guest today on Podcast for Inquiry. Seth is a former evangelical and Christian broadcaster who now hosts The Thinking Atheist, one of the most popular podcasts and online atheist communities in the world. Seth has authored five books, including Christianity Made Me Talk Like an Idiot. He also hosts a second podcast, True Stories with Seth Andrews. With a mix of humor and heart, Seth has spoken for audiences around the world about his former faith, the promotion of science and skepticism, the importance of humanism in this often crazy world, and why we should all pursue a personal relationship with reality. In our conversation, we talk about why and how Seth left Christianity from his evangelical roots, the embrace of many Christians of seemingly unchristian beliefs and policies, and what humanists need to do not to save the world, but to make it a better place for us all. I'm very happy to bring you my conversation with Seth Andrews. Welcome to the Podcast for Inquiry, brought to you by the Centre for Inquiry Canada, a national educational charity supporting your community for reason, compassion, and secular humanist values. You have answers, we have questions. I'm your host, Leslie Rosenblood, board member and secular chair for CFIC. Welcome. Today's guest on podcast for inquiry is Seth Andrews. Seth, I'm really looking forward to our conversation today. Yeah, it's good to be here. Thanks for the invitation, man. I am interested in, a, in to talk about a number of things, but I want to start with kind of your personal story. I know that you grew up as an evangelical Christian, and not only that, but that was uh, it wasn't just your philosophy and worldview, but it was was your profession. You were uh, uh, you were a, a DJ or a radio broadcaster uh, talking about evangelical evangelical Christianity and and assuring your listeners how how good and true and wonderful it all was. And I'm always fascinated to know how someone whose entire life is built around a particular premise uh, changes direction so dramatically, because now your main podcast is The Thinking Atheist, which is almost the polar opposite of uh, what you did uh, for, for many years in your youth. So can you tell us how that changed and, and what, uh, what, uh, how, your, how your worldview changed and, and, and what you went through personally to, uh, to change your life so dramatically? Well, you know, it's such a, a broad story. I actually am not shilling for my autobiography, but I wrote a whole book because people kept asking, how in the world? It's somebody who was raised in a fundy household, Christian school, Christian friends, Christian music, Christian church, Christian career. How does that person end up an atheist activist? And it's, uh, you know, it's an interesting question. Unfortunately, it doesn't lend itself to the short answer. But, you know, I, I was born into a family that was hardcore. Mom and dad were theologian level believers. They met at Oral Roberts University, Oral Roberts, the healing evangelist, quote unquote, healing evangelist. And, and uh, they honeymooned in the Holy Lands. My mother wrote a Greek New Testament study guide <laughs> that was used at the college level. I mean, these were not lightweight Sunday go to meet Christians. They were the real thing. And um, that was really our normal. Everything was Jesus and God and Jesus and God. It was very Puritan kind of a culture. And if you're raised where that is normal, you you just don't get introduced to the rest of the world. You become afraid of other ideas. You're reinforced in so many ways to not tap on the glass, to not ask the hard questions. And, uh, you know, I spent three decades as some flavor of Christian before finally at midlife, I started to give myself permission to ask those questions, to, you know, to, to say, maybe I'm you know, they, they like to say that, who are you to question God? Who, how does the insect brain, you know, how do we as the ant in God's ant farm understand? You know, and I, I always thought, well, I got tired of that explanation. I thought, well, no, I, I, I don't think a benevolent God would be the, 
the confusing, mysterious ways God. I think he would, in fact, be the God who was not an author of confusion. And so I started to tap on the glass, ask questions, take the hard journey. That was 2007. And, and lo and behold, the dominoes started to fall, you know. God is is all powerful and all good. Why does why does why does evil exist? Was uh, uh, there, there were there was there was more to it than that? But uh, was was just that you were looking at the world and it wasn't consistent with the existence of an all loving, all powerful God. Yeah, you know, it wasn't just the problem of evil or the problem of needless suffering or the problem of divine hiddenness. It was so many gears. I, I again, I wrote about this, but. When I was a Christian radio host in 1997, we had a very popular and beloved Christian artist. His name is Rich Mullins, and he sang a song that's still beloved in Christian circles today called Awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. Mm -hmm. And he was just kind of homegrown, uh, sort of this raw, unpolished gem of an artist that people really, really took personally. And she was horribly killed in a car accident in 1997. And it was charged to me and my co-host to go on the air and tell our listeners, you know, he was horribly killed, here's what's happened, and then I was designing the website page, the tribute page. And I remember as I was writing the, uh, the headline, it said, Welcome Home, Rich, meaning God had called him home. And the whole time I was writing the page, I thought... I am creating a mechanism for coping. Like this to me does not make any sense. God brought this guy to the forefront of ministry, beloved by millions all around the world. And then what he has his body shredded in the middle of a highway after he's struck by a semi in the middle of the night makes no sense. We are the ones who are writing a happy ending to this story. And that was one of the first seeds that really started to implant. My best friend came out to me as gay in the 1990s, and I was of the opinion, based in the Bible's teaching, that homosexuals are in rebellion against God and might be damned to hell. And we didn't speak for a year after that revelation until I realized that, you know, I miss this guy. and He's still the best person I know. And so I sort of took white out and sort of, uh, you know, removed that part of the Christian doctrine from my life and thought, well, you know, God wouldn't judge him. And and uh, then 9-11 was big. I saw everybody mm -hmm. invoking God, whether it was Jerry Falwell and Pat Robertson saying that God was punishing us for gay people. You know, we saw the Islamic terrorists who were invoking God as their excuse. You know, Allah be praised. We're going to go and wipe out the infidel. And mostly I just saw action, human action and reaction. I um, also had been doing work after I left Christian radio with, a lot of churches. I, I, I produced fundraising videos for churches all around the country. We raised millions and millions of dollars for church work. One thing about flying every weekend to a different church and spending all this time inside different church houses and speaking to their clergy and their members and their deacons and all these things is you really get kind of a sampling of, I don't know, the humanity of it and how they were all kind of doing their own thing, making it up as they went. They each had their own uh, kind of flavor, but no one seemed to agree. And, and, and the human-made aspect of it, all of these gears really were turning in my brain. And uh, that plus, I think, the, the impatience at midlife with trying to keep other people happy. I think as you get older, you become a little less interested in whether or not you keep the peace. <laughs> right? Have you noticed that? It's not even really peace at one point. It's just an absence of conflict. Well, I'm not going to say anything because so-and-so is going to lose their mind yeah. and I'm going to keep the peace. But, but that's not really peace. That's just an absence of conflict. I was the one sitting on their hands and I finally came to the point where I thought, why, why am I sitting on my hands? What kind of a benevolent, just God would punish me for asking good questions and wanting good answers? And despite my fears of hellfire and getting it wrong and losing people, friends, family, my job, I was worried about all those things. Mm -hmm. I decided to press on. And man, when you start asking questions, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's amazing the doors that open. It's amazing the things you discover. So actually, well, a podcast for inquiry and, and, and the Center for Inquiry Canada and really like my personal journey is all about asking questions and uh, seeking uh, genuine answers. Uh, and so what doors open? 
for you when you started asking questions? I'm, I'm fascinated by this process. You know, I was, here's an example. I was taught to distrust evolution. We call them evolutionists, right? Right. It's a cult, the cultists of evolution, right? I yeah. didn't know what it was. I'd never read Darwin's On the Origin of Species. I'd never read the work of any biological scientists at all. I got all my science from these religious books where their science questions were things like, um, you know, asking uh, why God loved the color green when he made the trees. I mean, these are just totally empty calorie, quote unquote, science questions that, that were just indoctrination. But I, I wasn't taught what evolution was. I just knew it was wrong. And I was trained to mock it and make fun of it. So here I am at the age of 37, and I crack open the God delusion by an evolutionary scientist. And that leads me into other books by evolutionary scientists. And it's not the caricature that I'd been taught to fear or ridicule, you know, from goo to the zoo to you. That's kind of how they framed it. Oh, you know, <laughs> one day a, a rabbit wakes, goes to bed and wakes up and gives birth to an ostrich. You know, th that's kind of the how we. Had right. And, uh, and of course, that's ridiculous. And yeah. you should. I, I, I can see why you would dismiss that as. Crazy. It, it was really. It, it was taught to us in a way where the the was it just a straw man? You know, they they just there was no understanding of how evolution worked. Evolutionary processes threatened my specialness because if I am an evolved creature in a universe that doesn't necessarily take me personally, then I am not the most important thing in the cosmos. I am not the center of a divine king's attention. I have not been adopted into his family and will be sent out on a crusade for his cause and then one day get a mansion and pearly gates and a crown and all those things. Maybe I'm not all that special. And so this idea that I am actually part of the evolved world in my mind at the time, it was a threat. It was that maybe I'm not all that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, it's interesting when people talk to me about how arrogant it must be how, how arrogant the non-believers are the people who yes. hold to the science of evolution are so arrogant i've heard you, that a lot you want to be gods right you think you're it and there's nothing above you and beyond you and therefore it's all about you and i always have to course correct them and say well no <laughs> you know, i'm now fully aware that i live in a universe that does not care what happens to me next and mm -hmm. uh, i'm a blip on a blip, <laughs> you know, among hundreds of billions of galaxies. And so that's a kind of humility that actually came as I began to understand how the processes of life, the universe and everything work. And, and contrary to what some people might think, it didn't freak me out, didn't make me feel worthless or purposeless. It didn't rob me of my joy. It actually gave me a greater sense of awe and wonder about the world, about the universe I live in. It actually has made me more grateful uh, knowing my place in the universe as small as it is. Yeah. And for me, it, it also like that perspective, which I share, uh, it, it drives my purpose as well, because I realize if things are going to get better, it's only going to be because of our efforts. It, it's our responsibility to make our lives. And I'm talking collectively, both like both individually and collectively, but there's, there's no one else guiding the process. So if we want to make things better for ourselves and for our communities, our countries and our, and our, our species and as a globe, it's, it's our collective responsibilities to make the changes to make things better. Uh, there's no, uh, I, I, I like the phrase, uh, there's no celestial safety net that's going to stop us from doing harm to ourselves or to each other or, or from going extinct. It has to be our responsibility. And that is, you have to be an adult about it, uh, but with that responsibility comes uh, a motivation to, all right, let's 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 make the change that we want to see in the world. Well, and you touch on a couple of, I think, really critical things. One, I think, is, is the idea of God showing up to essentially sweep up, right? I got mm -hmm. whatever. I mean, it's all temporary. We're all going to go to a hidden happy place in the sky one day so we can torch the planet and abuse resources and, and we can just be as reckless as we want. They don't say it that way, but it's really kind of the attitude that this is all the resources. God gave us dominion over dominion. the planet, the animals, right. life, trees, grass, oil, 
you know, what air, whatever we, it is now all under our dominion and we can use it up. In fact, we're supposed to use it up. And if we make a big mess in the process, who cares? Because this is not our home. This is just a temporary stop on our way to home. God's going to wipe out the earth anyway. And that's hugely problematic because we see whether it's climate change deniers or other type of science deniers or people who are simply acting in cruelty and with tremendous amounts of waste and irresponsibility as stewards of uh, the planet. You see, they just excuse it by saying, we're going to heaven anyway. That's really a problem. It also, I think, directs us to why we need to solve human problems. Because I think that one of the big things that feeds God belief in this world is suffering. If you find people who are in disadvantaged situations, who are going through pain, whether they were born without a penny or they're going through cancer, whether they had a child killed in a car accident or whether you know, they are being oppressed by a, a, a government in Iran. I mean, whatever. I think as long as you see people who are looking up, aching for a happier ending, saying, I need to be in a better place. I will one day have a better body. My problems will one day be solved. Well, that's when the religious... Uh, sort of stories become very attractive. They become a coping mechanism. And so when people ask me, well, how do you counter religious um, superstitions? How do you, there's all these magical claims in the world. Do you think they'll ever go away? And I'm like, well, I don't think as long as there is suffering, people are ever going to totally get rid of magical thinking because they will be aching for a magical solution to very real problems. And one of the best tactics that we can use if we are going to create a less dogmatic, less fundy, less superstitious, more rational world, we have to alleviate human suffering. We have to solve each other's problems. And so that's why, even though I host a website that has atheist in the title, I'm much more a humanist as an activist. Humanism is kind of my thing. Right, uh, I I can understand that. That's the the, the call to uh, call to activism rather than just stating that there's this very common belief in the world that I that I don't share. And that's a great segue into another topic that I want to talk about, which is which is politics and what, to my mind, is sort of the odd convergence of uh, what you were describing, the incredible waste and in using uh, uh, and abusing the resources of the world with uh, with with Christian with 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 Christian thought. I mean, I uh, if, if you read, you know, at least certain segments of 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 Jesus's teachings where, you know, we should feed the hungry and clothe the naked and and alleviate poverty and take care of the poor. These are all you know, good things. And, and but it seems to be uh, to, to use to use the word pejoratively the way many on on the right in the United States do these seem way too woke for real Christians to to even contemplate and I'm I'm wondering how did uh, it's you can object to Christianity either on um, sort of physical grounds or, or like we we can observe that the God claim is doesn't hold up to scrutiny, but increasingly it seems to me we can reject Christian uh, teachings on moral grounds. What the at least what the loudest voices in Christianity are are talking about are the the rejection of of, of, of homosexuals, of of trans kids, uh, of uh, of. Uh, women's bodily autonomy, and they seem to be on the wrong side of so many moral questions, almost in contravention of at least some of the scriptural teachings. And I'm wondering, how did that happen? And, uh, I, 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 and you had almost an inside view of things for a while, and I'd be very interested in hearing your insights. I'm seeing a clash of cultures. You know, it's like people like to talk about Christians like they're one thing. Yeah, I mean, there are there are very much liberal Christians too. There's a congregation just down the street from me that pr uh, portrays the uh, um, the LGBT flag. And so it's not a, a monolithic group, but they seem to be, uh, they seem to be a minority 
uh, and and almost a you know countercultural. Well, you know, we tend to make religions in our own image in many cases. It's like when I have Amanda Tyler, who is the founder of Christians Against Christian Nationalism, and she is a devout Baptist. She is fighting the Christian nationalists, the anti uh, you know the, the LGBT bigotry and, and the anti human rights culture, this wave of cruelty and hatred and inequality, she's fighting that. She's my ally in that way. Mm -hmm. And I had a conversation with her and I was like, well, how do you jive all of this with the Bible's take on women, (laughs) you know, silencing (laughs) women and all these types of things? And in her responses, I realized that she was speaking about a Jesus that most fit her moral compass. And I find the same is true on the other side of that coin. I think people who embrace the anti-gay and the the anti-equality and the cruelest verses of the Bible, hell theology, those types of things, I think that's something, it feeds something in them. I I think maybe it's an excuse for the the bigotry and the cruelty that they feel inside. I, I think our gods often look a lot like us. There are so many gears in that machine, though, including the priming of devout fundamentalist religious people for conspiracies and for authoritarianism. And I think this explains a lot of what has been going on. The Bible, Christianity itself is a conspiracy theory. The story of Christianity, right? A plan is put in place, and now the evil agent is trying to thwart the plan. But he will not succeed because our spies are in their midst and their spies are in our midst. And there's all of these, you know, mechanisms going. Christianity is a conspiracy theory. And so I think we're seeing one of the reasons why all these wacky stories that come out, QAnon, et cetera, get lapped up so quickly by magical thinkers is because they have already been primed to respond to the fantastic, to have those emotional things, those, those nerves struck and they go, aha, yes, it must be beyond that Christianity, Islam, etc. Fundy religions are by design authoritarians. They teach you to become a sheep. They are an attack on the self, right? There is no one worthy. No, not one, uh, more of Jesus, less of me, right? Not me, but Christ who lives in me. Essentially, it is surrendering my identity, and then I follow the identity of a leader or a group or cult. We do this with Yahweh. We do this with Jesus. We see that it done with uh, pastor, shepherd figures within religions. They are my shepherd. I am the flock. They teach. I learn. They lead. I follow, right? Don't question too much because obedience is what is commanded of us by the authority with a capital A. So now you have a culture primed for authoritarians who are waving Bibles and invoking the name of God. Those people come in and can command immediate attention. Donald Trump knows nothing about the Bible. He knows nothing about Christianity. I'm convinced he doesn't care at all about God, doesn't believe in God. I think he's the only God in his life, right? But all he had to do was to show up, wave a Bible he does not read, and invoke a God he does not believe in, and people primed to respond to authoritarian figures lapped that up, and they said, that is my shepherd, I will now follow. And I think sociopaths and cult leaders of all stripes have learned the power of authoritarian thinking and maneuvering. And I've, we see that with so many people out there, Ron DeSantis and others. You know, I don't know, we could talk about the sociology behind religious thinking all day, but I think you know, those are a few of the key things that I've been seeing. Yeah, and, and that type of surrender to a higher uh, authority, uh, or and you know it's a higher authority because they told you it's a higher authority. And I mean, ultimately, the way I've had it conversations with uh, many Christian friends is that God is a bully and you have to, you have to obey him because he is all powerful. And if you, if you defy him, you're going to hell. And if you, if you listen to him, you're going to heaven. And I thought like, that's, that's not a moral position. That's, that's, as, as you call it, it's an authoritarian. That means God is a bully. And then you're not believing in God because of his, 
goodness and because it's the right thing to do. You're doing it because you're scared of hell and you don't want to do that. And you're cowed by that. And it's, it, and, it's, and does that speak to the response, the eager, gleeful response to the bullies? Right? We see healthy demonstrations of strength in this world. You know, people who can use their strength to lift others up, to mm -hmm. heal wounds, to build bridges, to create things. And then you see others and they use strength to bully and to be cruel and to break down and to condemn and insult and devastate and smash everything that's in their path. And there is a culture of people, even and perhaps even especially within the church, the American Christian church right now, and they admire the cruelty of someone like a Donald Trump, et cetera, because they see that as strength, right? If we're on the side of right, and we are strong, we will then go and defeat the enemy, crush the weak. The weak, of course, are under the influence of Satan. And I think it's the celebration of cruelty that is the most disturbing to me. There are so many Christians. If my mother mm -hmm. had raised me to behave like Donald Trump, right? I bragged about groping women, and I had bilked vendors out of their money in business deals, and I had used the Lord's name in vain, and I had lusted, and I loved money. If I'd done all of these things that Christ said never to do, my mother would have thought, I failed as a parent. I failed. I could, I've raised, you are the antithesis of what I wanted in a good Christian man. But when I bring up Donald Trump, immediately that tone switched, and she's like, what a great man of the Lord. And I just can't help. Really? But think, oh my God. Absolutely. Yeah. And I can't, I can't help but think why the double standard or does she consider that to be, he's a warrior, right? It doesn't matter what else he does. As long as he is, he he's God's man. So the then, ends justify the means. I mean, I, I, th this conversation's kept me up at night. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I'm I'm Canadian, and I've I, I've looked and and uh, and it's that uh, merging has always struck me as as bizarre because here is someone who is multiply married, a uh, philanderer, uh, the, the uh, crude, uh, and really in his presentation is about as ungodly a person as one could concoct even and yet the I, 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 from my perspective up in canada he said i'll put supreme court justices and outlaw abortion in the land and, and it just seemed like the evangelical said, well that priority trumps if you'll pardon the pun trumps everything else and so we're behind you 100 percent, and we'll forgive all of these things that we have condemned in others for decades. Uh, is that off base or does that? No, uh, it's absolutely. It, it is absolutely true that a single issue candidate can run into, this is why Trump changed his own position on abortion right before he ran for the presidency, right? Because he used to be pro-abortion and it became politically expedient. When he ran as a Republican, he switched and said abortion is wrong. And then he concocted these tremendously crazy, insane stories about, you know, abortions in the operating room in the delivery room at you know eight months and 29 days and 23 hours as they rip the babies out and then twirl their mustaches and laughed and blah blah but he had all these mm -hmm. horror stories he totally misrepresented what roe v wade even was but because he landed on what the believers consider to be the right side of an issue that might result in murder if you get it wrong, right? He is a pro-life candidate. The switch goes off for everything else because what could be more important than protecting the life of a baby? So now anything else he does, eh, you know, he's imperfect. Well, the Lord sometimes uses imperfect people. The King Cyrus argument comes to mind. But, you know, at least he's on the right side of this. I've also seen other people where it's totally just tribal. You can be the worst person in the world, as long as you're a Republican, <laughs> right? right? Anybody but the Democrat, anybody but the other. So, um, so I don't have a sense of what's right and what's wrong independently. What is right and what is wrong is defined by what my party 
says. So if my party <laughs> says something is good, then I'm 100% in favor of it. If they say that it's bad, I'm 100% against it. I'm not coming to my own conclusions about what's right or wrong. Uh, it's defined by others. It is, that, is. is that what you mean by tribalism? Political I think, tribalism? Yeah. Well, it's like the worst person in my in-group is going to be better than the best person in the out-group. There, right. There's so much <laughs> of this othering that we see. And everybody does it. I did a whole speech about tribes and how tribalism or in-group models, communities in some ways can be very healthy. It's part of who we are as human beings, mm -hmm. communal creatures. And so we will gather and join together when it comes to family or shared interests or shared values or whatever. I mean, football fans are tribes. People who go to a rock concert for a certain group, that's a tribe of people who enjoy mm -hmm. that genre. Uh, you find uh, people who on bowling night, you know, everywhere you got churches, what's church if not tribalism? And we can see sub tribes in Christianity. How many splinters are there of different types of Christians? And they have their own in groups. And so we see all of this, but the dark side of it is, is as we other people, we become the superior, they become the inferior. We are inside, they are outside. Well, the worst of our in group is still better than the best of their ad right. I've had awesome. people who have, uh, they have been aghast when they find out that I am an atheist, but they were more aghast at the fact that I voted Democrat. And they didn't <laughs> ask any questions. They didn't ask any question like, well, where did that come from? And what do you, what do you think? What was, what was the platform? And what do you, what's your perspective? There was no meaningful dialogue. It was just the R and the D and that's all they needed. And then they became sort of huffy and dismissive. And I felt that sort of sneering disdain. And, you know, it's, I think we see a lot of uh, tribes and tribalism that feed a lot of what we're doing. You know, trust the in-group, everything the in-group says, distrust everything the out-group says. I mean, uh, QAnon, what's Q if not tribe, right? We know more than everybody else. We're smarter than those other sheeple who have been deceived. They, you know, they they trust science. They trust the historians. They trust the news. Uh, we're we've outsmarted everyone. And then they get together and their clicks and they pat each other on the back. They're fortified in how many different ways as human beings, as a tribe. I don't know. There's so so much going on there. So. Yeah, there's there. I mean, any form of group identity or or, or tribe fosters in-group amity, but it comes at the expense of out-group enmity. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I, that's, I think one of the reasons that we see some of the more egalitarian and even humanistic people in this world are the ones that travel more. Those who get out of their bubble and introduce themselves to other people, other ideas, other values, other cultures, other everything, mm -hmm. they tend to be the people who are less fearful who are less conspiratorial, who are less worried about things like national borders and waving the standards of our country over them and, and sort of this personal superiority. And they become more about us as brothers and sisters on planet Earth. And this has been studied. I find it very interesting that those who are more apt to retreat into uh, a bubble, they more apt to live behind their walls that's where you really see bigotry and fear start to foster. But those who open the doors and introduce themselves to the world all around them, I think those are the people that become less judgmental, more egalitarian, more humanistic in that way. Well, when you actually meet other people, you realize that they're other people, yeah. right? They're not these, these monsters or these degenerates, these caricatures that are painted to you. They go, don't be like those, those people that, and, and, you know, all these negative traits associated with them. If you actually know them and, and speak to them, you'll realize they're probably in most ways, a lot, a lot like you, you know, they, you know, they, they have their, their loved ones. They probably take care of their family, want the best for their, their, their kids and their parents and their friends and themselves and are working towards, towards those goals. And are not at all like the, the monsters that they have been portrayed at. But to counter that narrative, you actually have to have some knowledge that comes from outside that self-reinforcing system from, from within the tribe. And so I think that, I think that you're right about, uh, about exposure to the world. When I meet somebody, I live in strawberry red MAGA conservative Oklahoma, USA. Okay. Okay. And so when I go out, and I'm introduced to somebody, 
I don't lead with, hi, I'm Seth, I'm an atheist activist, right? I just don't do that because, that, first of all, it's not, that's not what I lead with. It's not my, being an atheist is not my identity. Right. Um, I lead with, I'm Seth. And you know, it's like on my tennis team, there was a, a group of uh, a few highly religious people, and we knew each other from the tennis court. Hi, I'm Seth. Nice to meet you. We play a match. We all hang out. We enjoy each other. Maybe occasionally we'll all go out and have a burger after the game. Weeks pass before they finally really find out what I do for a living. And had I led with, I'm an atheist, before they got to know me as a three-dimensional flesh and blood human being, they might have just winked out and dropped out. They might have just cut that cord, said, we don't want to be even be on the court with the guy. But because they got to know me as a person first, because they thought, well, he's a guy who's fun to be around. He loves his wife. He seems to be a person of good moral character, and he's, we enjoy his company. Wow, I hope he shows up to the next match, and we'll all go out. And, right? You have that kind of thing. And then when they find out that I don't believe in any God anywhere, it's a whole lot harder to write me off. It's a whole lot harder to put me in a box and then crush that box because they've already seen me as someone who shares the planet with them in a very human way. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a lesson there. So often we, we lead with labels and, you know, atheists it, and libs and everybody, we can all be guilty of doing that to other people. And I'll tell you, it frustrates me because I, I, we like to think that we're immune from this sort of binary thinking, this cookie cutter, highly tribalistic othering, but everybody does it. I, you know, liberals do it to conservatives, atheists do it to religious people. Everybody does it to everybody, and none of us are immune. And I don't think it's a cheat, and it's not a false equivalence argument to say that we all need to be very aware of our biases of reductive thinking and perhaps being unfair. There are a lot of horrible people in the world, but not everybody that we have labeled in that way may fit the label. We need to go deeper. And I think that's fair. Yeah. And uh, I mean, it's in many ways, it's exhausting to always come up with your opinions, derive them from first principles. And, and we use heuristics and shortcuts and uh, some, and when, but when you don't, when you don't, go and, and and really delve into why you think something and, or what your opinion is and write down to the various sources. Uh, when you do take shortcuts that you, you can go astray, but it's, it takes a tremendous amount of discipline. And honestly, there's not enough time in the day to do that for everything that you see. You need to rely on sources that you trust or, or parrot arguments that for one reason or another you found persuasive or to reuse the uh, conclusion that you came to before and say, this situation is close enough to that other one and I'm going to do that again. I think it's a very understandable human trait and I agree we are all uh, susceptible to it, but it uh, it is. It can be a very, a very dangerous uh, uh, aspect of our natures that allows us to uh, either condemn or uh, unquestioningly condemn or unquestioningly accept uh, propositions or people or, or arguments uh, with insufficient or uh, uh, non-existent evidence. I, you know, the Twitterverse hasn't helped, right? I mean, we live in the two hundred and eighty character Twitterverse. <laughs> I don't know. I, I still call it Twitter because it'll always. Yeah, be I, I, I know nobody I know actually yeah. refers it to it by X. It's uh, yeah. it's still Twitter in everyone's mind. You know, if I see someone and I see them say one thing, I may just totally go way off the chain and assume a bunch of other stuff about them. I will treat people so differently online that I would ever treat them if we were having coffee together, and I think. The technology of the internet that has so connected us has also so very much divided us. It's made it, it's never been easier to tar and feather somebody, to just roast them alive from a distance, from our distant vantage. And it's the dehumanizing that really, really bothers me. You know, it, we, the internet, you know, in, in the uh, technology and the time of hits and clicks, often monetized hits and clicks, people have monetized our outrage. They know where our buttons are. They know how to push them, and they often get paid for doing so. 
Maybe hmm. we get paid with an endorphin rush because we get to feel superior and then everybody rushes to our defense and it's us versus them. And it's a war online and days pass as we keyboard warrior ourselves into a, into oblivion. And I've had to step away from that a little bit because it started to affect me, <laughs> you know, just seeing the nonstop conflict and the vilification and the drama and the, and the unnecessary escalation it's it started to really kill a part of my heart i felt the scar tissue there and i had to really start to partition away uh, a lot of that and find opportunities to rehumanize and then i started doing this experiment and it happened just a couple of weeks ago uh, somebody a relatively public figure popped onto my page after i'd said something they disagreed with and they snarked pretty pretty hard at me and okay fine my first response, my first thought was, I can get my snark on. All right, I've got a sarcasm gene. I'm going to go back and I'm going to I'm going to hit him. I'm going to throw the zinger at him. But I stopped. Right. And I said, "Hey, you know, I just want you to know that uh, pre first of all, I'm a big fan of your work. <laughs> no kidding. I follow your stuff. I I just think your stuff's amazing, and I, I think we stand apart. Let me tell you what I was thinking when I typed this original thought. So instead of saying, you idiot, why would you come to my page to complain, blah, 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 and then go on the defensive, I used the language of de-escalation, and I said, I appreciate you. Let me kind of tell you where I'm at and then tell me what you think about that. He came back and said, man, thanks for kind of the high road response. I really appreciate you. Kind of here's what I was thinking, but I totally understand. And all of a sudden, the temperature dropped mm -hmm. and we became friends. And it wasn't about winning. It was about sort of interacting and discussing and being people. And I've been trying that more and more. And it's amazing how often I'm seeing success. Instead of knee-jerking into keyboard warrior mode and trying to win, uh, when it comes to the everyday people, I still go hard at the public figures. You know, the Marjorie Taylor Greens of the world, <laughs> you know, the Mitch McConnells of the world will never get quarter from me. I, I, I think they're fair game. But in the everydays and the one-on-ones, when I might be dealing with someone who is not the devil, I've really tried to change how I approach them. And it has improved dramatically my experiences in, and it's improved the conversations I've been having online. I don't know. Forgive me. I just kind of went off on a bunny trail there, <laughs> but it was what was on my mind. So. This, this is important. I mean, one of the things I'm trying to do with podcast for inquiry is to have intelligent and nuanced conversations on complicated and sometimes uh, controversial subjects, uh, never with rancor, or at least I do my best, uh, never with caricature, but to explore a topic and, and try and lead by example of, uh, we, how you can talk about difficult topics, either because they're difficult, uh, emotionally, or they're just inherently complex. And so they're challenging to understand and, and, and to give people more than just a surface level understanding over the course of you know, 45 minutes or, or an hour. Uh, I, hopefully we're succeeding with that. Um, but I, I think that's similar to what your goal is with the, with the thinking atheist. Uh, how would you, or how do you see trying to restore reason and de-escalation and actual interaction rather than flame wars into <laughs> Uh, not just not just in not just into the interactions that you have with others, but as as part of the of the public discourse and and to resist the urge of demonization of someone who dares disagree with you or criticize. Yeah, it's a balancing act for me. I have worked really hard to shield the thinking atheist content from drama. And every tribe, every group, every organization, every culture has seen drama. They've seen strong egos, strong opinions, conflict, mm -hmm. escalation, sometimes necessary conflict, necessary escalation. I think sometimes you do have to, to root out bad agents. You have to expose the awful. And sometimes those can be really unpleasant moments. But... 
I've also seen a lot of people who they just go in and they just make it freaking worse. And then they go public and then someone else does a response blog and someone else makes a video and there's a response video. And then there's all, I mean, everybody's choosing sides. Everybody's shouting, nobody's listening. And I've been desperate to protect this audience from that, not with a head in the sand approach, but my listeners and viewers don't show up at the show because they want to hear what so-and-so whispered about such and such or two egos clashing and colliding and having a, and airing all their dirty laundry. They're not there for that. They're there to, to have community, to be entertained and learn things. And I put myself in that camp because the guests I have on so many of them, so much more educated, much smarter than I am. I'm learning along with the audience. It's a, a place where I'm not opposed to a believer or someone challenging me on the phone or calling me on the show or giving me, you know, uh, some pushback here and there. But it, it, it is a culture that is really dominated by kindness. And it's not weakness. It's not acquiescence. It's strong. It's I think kindness should be strong. I think uh, this idea, again, we're, to, we're back to the, the whole culture of cruelty where some people think in order to, to be strong, you have to crush others. But I don't believe that at all. I think sometimes it, the easiest thing to do is to throw a tantrum and break things. Mm -hmm. I think that that's any seven-year-old can do that. To be true, they have tempered, mature strength is to find opportunities to lift others. And so I have promoted on my show a culture of kindness. When it comes to everyday people, I'm very, very kind when it comes to people who share my former faith. I am married to someone who believes in God. She's more of a deist, but she came out of a culture where she called herself a Christian, and she is the best person I know. And I, I think people are hungry for that, to rehumanize these conversations, because if we don't care, why would anyone listen to what we had to say? How do you how do you, how have you done that? Like you're the thinking atheist has been around a lot longer than podcast for inquiry. What have you done to inculcate a culture of kindness uh, in in the in your show and in the community that you have built up over the years? Well, first, I have made a pledge not to take all of the bait that gets thrown out. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, we, there are people desperate for our oxygen. I see apologists, I see trolls, I see agents of chaos, and they are desperate to jump into this spotlight and cause a stir and get attention, get noticed. They are desperate for oxygen that they want me to feed them. I have made a pledge not to do that. Uh, I'm not saying that I don't ever engage people with bad ideas, but in the, in the internet era, if you stop and trip on every pebble, you will never, ever get anything done. The second thing I have done is to lead by example. The tone and temperature of what I do, what I say and the way I say it, warts and all, flaws and all, is, it's real, but it's also kind. And that if that affects, it affects the podcast, it affects how the website's done, it affects how the, the social media pages are populated. And that's sort of a top-down thing. The other thing I, I have done, and I don't know if this is the right decision, is in order to avoid conflict and drama and all those types of things, I work pretty much alone. <laughs> I've got a few people who have volunteered their time and I've got, uh, you know, they've, they've been wonderful. But I'm paranoid about having a staff because I don't know how much time I have to be able to vet people and will they produce content in the way that I feel like it needs to be done and what happens if there's a blow up and then everyone goes public and I've just become, I've got such a bad taste in my mouth about some of the other free thought groups that have had inner politics and drama and explosions and it's all gone so very nastily public that I've just myself thought, well, even if it limits what we are, uh, you know, I, I'm going to protect uh, the, the, the model, the engine of the Thinking Atheist podcast and content by not allowing rogue agents the opportunity to come in. And I don't know if that's the right decision. You know, I, mm -hmm. I, but it's kind of a, it, it, I'm not sure what else to do. 
Well, I'm also it, a little bit of a control freak. Maybe I yeah. just don't want to. Give <laughs> it up makes it very wings. much a Seth Andrews production uh, instead of an institution of it. It's uh, it's like if its someone if someone's if I say I want you to to find some content to post on social media. That person, what if they grab something that that makes fun of religious people and calls them a, a slur, or what if they what if they post something that has not been vetted? and has been debunked that comes from a conspiracy site, but it just happens to be pro atheism, you know, mm -hmm. then that, that diminishes the power of what we do. It kills credibility. It's just wrong. And, uh, so to develop the mechanisms where I know that good vetted content that fits the attitude of this community, that's been hard for me. I'd love to be able to do it, but I just haven't got to the point yet where I feel like I can trust myself to, to, to develop it. And I worry about all these strong personalities in one place, having seen so many blow ups elsewhere. So it's, it's an imperfect compromise for sure. Yeah. The, uh, something that I've struggled with a lot is, uh, just finding, being able to determine, uh, a, a principled disagreement. I mean, we're, we're both humanists, but we may have very different ideas on, on, uh, politics or, our, or even if we agree on values, the relative, uh, priorities of them and what practical actions we should take. And do we compromise here to make an incremental improvement or do we hold out for, to get the full, uh, the full thing that we want? And these are all good faith arguments to have. Uh, and, and they need to be, they need to be worked out in groups, but, uh, there are also bad actors. You, you, you mentioned earlier there, there are trolls and, uh, uh, agents of chaos who are who are just there to try and uh, uh, get clicks or or to disrupt the conversation that uh, that are having here, and unfortunately, I have not been able to figure out an efficient way to determine if someone is disagreeing with me in good faith or or just disagreeing or to, because they they want to start an argument, and that. Uh, uh, I don't know if, if you have any insights on that, but uh, I, I, that might just be another way of rephrasing the challenge that you're having, uh, which is why which is why you've kept things very very close to the chest. Yeah, I, I think the word that you and I are are really sort of revolving around now is intent. How do I gauge the intent of an interlocutor? Mm -hmm. There are some people out there, and I've seen some of my fellow liberals and atheists who they don't care at all about what somebody's intention is. All they care about is the end result of what they do. So somebody who's got good intention, who is not trying to be the villain in their own story, may have a bad idea, okay? Or a disagreeing idea. And there are some who are like, well, I don't care what your intention is. All I know is that people are being hurt by what you're doing. Therefore, you are now my enemy and I must crush you. And I find that unfortunate because I think, well, you know, if this is a good person with a bad idea, welcome to humanity, right? <laughs> <laughs> welcome to me. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'd like to, uh, Seth Andrews. Okay. Let's see. He's a biblical literalist. He was a, uh, uh, an anti gay bigot. He was a Christian nationalist who believed the country belonged to him and his people more than all others. He was, you know, xenophobic. He was conspiratorial. He was all these things. The Seth I mean, Andrews guy you described doesn't sound very nice. I don't I'm think just, I, like I deserve to be destroyed, right? Because I am, I'm a horrible person or I'm an idiot or, uh, you know, whatever. And I'm like, no, I was a good guy who had been the victim of bad ideas. And I simply needed a chance. I needed someone to approach me in good faith. People change their minds from a position of safety. You will not attack people into better ideas. And I get so sick and tired of people being like, I'm going to insult someone until they know how stupid they are. That's not how identity beliefs work. And that's not how minds are changed. I, just a few episodes ago, I spoke with David McRaney and he, he wrote a book called How Minds Change. And this was exactly what we spoke about. And that is the, the thesis of his book. He wanted, he saw people like you who you know, changed their minds about something so central and so core to themselves, as well as trivial things along the way. And he was fascinated by the process. And 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 you're you're right. Uh, people 
uh, will, if they're attacked, they'll put up their defenses and 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 not not change their mind. They won't evaluate your arguments if it's coming at them uh, with the intention to to hurt, insult, belittle, or demean. It has to be a uh, more of a interaction and a, and a meeting of minds and, and of equals. And then they have to go away and think about it because uh, there might be a flaw in your arguments that I can't come up with over the course of a conversation before I'm willing to change my mind about, about something. That's why I use the Socratic method a lot, just to use questions. And, and I, I also think that if someone, we genuinely believe their intent is to try to do the right thing, even if they've got a horrible idea, instead of setting them on fire, right? Mm -hmm. Which is the, it's epidemic. Crush these people, blast them, ridicule them, make them afraid to show their face in public, that type of thing. I think if I am genuinely a humanist, I want to see people rescued from bad ideas. And I want to see myself rescued if I happen to have a bad idea as well. Mm -hmm. But th these require conversations. Melanie Teresa Green over, or not Green, Melanie Teresa King over at thinkingispower.com said a great line on the show the other day that I've stolen. I just use it all the time. And she said, people <laughs> will not care what you believe unless they believe that you care. Absolutely. If I show up with data points and bat somebody over the head with them, I'm not going to change. That is not how we change the world. But because they won't care what I believe unless they believe that I care, unless they, they feel safe with me. And that's a moment where conversations can begin. So back to the original question of determining intent, it's imperfect. I do think sometimes we can see if someone's just being a jerk mm -hmm. or they're filling a, a, you know, the void of insecurity by trying to make us, you know, they, they're trying to knock us down to make themselves look better if they just want attention or other people who may be good people who are just indoctrinated or have bad ideas. As best we can, I think we still have to try to make that determination. And most importantly, we don't write everybody off who disagrees with, uh, with us and then try to wipe them off the planet, right? I, I, I genuinely think we, we, have to, we have to be able to live in a world with people who have opposing ideas without trying to set them all on fire. Instead, I'd rather change minds then you know commit myself to trying to wipe everybody out who's not on uh, in my group kind of thing yeah i think we definitely need more compassion in the world today and uh, that can open the doors to tremendous positive change but it, it that 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 that's an ingredient that is missing in far too many of our conversations and in our interactions yeah and I, I hope that the work that, that is happening now, and I think I've seen an evolution of atheist activism over the last, I've been doing this for 16 years, 15 years. Um, it used to be mostly just mockery and mockery has its place, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I go after, I think there's a liberation exercise when you take the things that were deemed sacred and untouchable and you say, this no longer scares me. I'm not afraid to ridicule it. I think that can be a liberation exercise, especially on the larger macro stage. But, you know, it used to be mostly it was uh, pretty unfortunate language about the creatard and the religiotard and all these, these types of things that weren't even, I mean, it was just horrible, horrible. Not even an argument. It was just superior snarking. Right. It, it, it not just exactly the mere image of what you were saying yeah. at the beginning of our conversation about the uh, uh, evolutionists and uh, yeah. uh, and, the, and the stupid people who didn't believe in God. Or just bad idea, bad arguments. Religion is a mental illness. I swear, if I have to hear that one more time, I'm, religion, religious people are not mentally ill. You know, I just think religion is an idea. I wasn't mentally ill when I was a believer, and I believed as, as hard as anybody. I was a hardcore, fundy believer. And, and there's so many of those types of arguments that we used to see a lot of. We're seeing less of it now, and we're getting more into the psychology of belief. Mm -hmm. How does the brain work? What is an identity belief? 
What triggers happen in the amygdala whenever an identity belief is confronted? Why the fight or flight reflex? How do you get through that? You know, understanding how beliefs are formed and defended, I think that's the ticket to changing minds in this world. The, the machine of ideas. We have to understand the, the inner workings, the mechanisms of identity beliefs. And I'm seeing more of that, not enough, but I am seeing more of that these days. And I think that's, that's a step in the right direction for sure. Well, I, I wish you all the best in, uh, in, in your continuing efforts to promote more humanity in humanism. And uh, I can assure you that that's what we're going to be doing as well here at the Center for Inquiry Canada. Uh, Seth Andrews, uh, thank you for this enlightening and fascinating conversation. Any, uh, any final thoughts to share with our audience? Well, I think, uh, you know, mostly on my radar these days has been trying to overcome my own sense of, I don't know, it's, I, I'm, not, I'm not tired, I'm weary. I mean, does anyone else relate to that? Like you just wake up in the morning and you log on to the world and it's like damage report, <laughs> you know, the rise of the Christian nationalist and the hostile takeover of the Supreme Court in the United States and Trump cults. And, the, you know, we've got white supremacists who are waving Nazi flags in Florida. And I, you know, sometimes I just become overwhelmed by it and I have to stop and will myself and recenter myself to remember that we are seeing a growing secularization of the culture, especially the 30 and under crowd. The, the, those generations are not interested in the religious bigotry of their parents and grandparents. Many of them are activated secular students who are engaged and they're not interested in, in taking away a woman's reproductive rights or condemning a gay person or or being xenophobic and bigoted against a foreign person. You know, they see us all as the, the, we're seeing more and more of that. And so one of the, the reasons that these institutions are being sort of uh, taken over is that they're, they're being attacked by the, the zealots is because the zealots realize the writing is on the wall. More and more, we are living in the United States that does not look like them. It terrifies them, but I think it should be a moment of encouragement for the rest of us. We must be vigilant. But I, I, I'm interested to see what the overall demographic of this country looks like 10, 15 years from now and what fruit that might bear in the institutions all around us. My hope is for a secular and perhaps more rational America if we can survive until then. So that's yeah. my, well, my final uh, thought. Here, here. I, I, <laughs> I, 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 the it, government neutrality in matters of religion is uh, is, is one of my passion uh, yeah. uh, activist uh, stances, and I, I, I hope to see more of it, not just in Canada, not just in the United States, but uh, but around the world. And the the trend lines are are positive, but uh, that uh, it's far from uniform. I think uh, I think it was Martin Luther King Jr. who said that the the, the the arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice. And I, I do think that there, there is cause for op optimism, but not complacency. You said that vigilance is required. And I think that uh, the effort, your continued efforts and, and those uh, who share our humanist philosophies are, are required to see that, uh, that better world in the years to come. But it is, it is possible. I will keep activisting if you will. All right. We'll All just right. keep kicking and see what happens. Well, thank you. Uh, this has been great, and I hope to have the opportunity to speak with you again. It's a pleasure. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. Links for today's discussion can be found in the show notes. If you enjoyed today's podcast, please show your support at patreon.com slash podcast for inquiry, and give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Email us, podcast at centerforinquiry.ca. We'd love to hear your perspective. The Podcast for Inquiry is brought to you by the Center for Inquiry Canada. We are a national educational charity supporting reason, compassion, and secular values. Help us support rational discourse and evidence-based decision-making by becoming a member at centerforinquiry.ca slash join. CFIC is on the web and Facebook and Twitter at CFI Canada. 
Podcast for Inquiry is produced and edited by Lee Shields, Zach Dumont, and Martin Zielinski. Music by Anthony Lazaro. I'm your host, Leslie Rosenblatt. See you next time. Thank you.